Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Big bucks can't see you is the topic for today on this podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined by JJ and Mike Ducart, and special guest all the way from South Carolina, Mr. Joe Miles from Osseo Gear. Uh, you have been on quite the roll already this year. You got a couple bucks on the ground. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, camouflage, deer's eyesight, and uh, some really cool gear, some really cool tools uh, that Joe and his team have developed at Osseo Gear. We've used them, been testing them uh, for the last year or so. Uh, really cool podcast, really cool information that we got coming your way today. So, Joe, welcome to the studio. Uh, what's going on, man? Man, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, This is God's country up here for sure, man, driving in from the airport, you know, with the leaves changing and all that and 60 degree weather it's 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 nice it's still about 90 at home so it's so kind of rough down there but i'm um, super glad to be here thanks for having me up you bet well we're excited excited to have you up and uh i guess let's just start tell us a little about uh, about the start to your season here yeah so south carolina is interesting state we start august 15th and go till january 1st so it's a it's a really long season uh, we can shoot five bucks down there, so we do we do get the velvet season, and we got a lot of numbers. I know that you know for guys in the north, that's kind of kind of hard to envision shooting five bucks in a year, and you know a lot of guys don't do that, but um, you do have the opportunity to do that. And uh, yeah, the, the season started great. Um, you know, all about food early, and we have a, a fruit. I don't know, do y'all have muscadines up here? No, nope. you don't have that. So we, <clears throat> it's like a wild grape. And they, they, they get where the deer really like them in, in August. And so if you can find some muscadine vines, it's it's kind of, you know, you, you put a camera on there, just hunt there, and it's, it's dynamite. So, of course, you know, found some of that and found, a, you know, two mature bucks and, and shot one on the 15th. And then, you know, basically right behind him shot another one. So it was, yeah, really good start. That's that's awesome, man. We're we're jealous. Saw the the pictures popping up there, and if you follow Deer Sadi or, or Joe and Osseo, um, you can check those bucks out. We're jealous up here. You know, our season's not open, and JJ's text me. He's like, "Oh, look, Joe shot another one." I'm like, <laughs> "Son of a gun!" <laughs> like, ready to get out there. No, that's awesome though, and and great start. You know, our season's open up here now, and we're starting to get in some of those cool temperatures. We did a podcast last week on kind of that first October shift and seeing some new bucks moving in and, and deer moving off those summer patterns and going to continue to talk about those shifts throughout the season and do some more podcasts surrounding that. But, you know, let's kind of jump in um, to Osseo and and what you've done um, with with the camouflage and the gear. And obviously we at the Deer Society um, have, have been wearing it now for the last year and been testing it out. And, and uh, we'll get into some stories. I know JJ's got some stories of wearing the gear last year, but just walk me through kind of an introduction on on osseo gear how it was developed how it started and kind of where you guys are at now yeah you know i I always wanted to get into the apparel space the hunting apparel space and i I just never could really figure out what camouflage pattern that we wanted to wanted to use one that really made sense and you know over the years i did quite a bit of sheep hunting sheep and goat hunting And you wear really extreme gear because of the temperatures. And I mean, it can be life and death. Some of the hunts you go on in the mountains, you know, way up in the Rockies, August, September in Alaska, you know, in the Wrangell Mountains and stuff. I mean, it it can be brutal. And I saw the gear that, that the sheep hunting or the mountain hunting community had, and it was just head and shoulders above what us as whitetail hunters you know, what, what we had. And, and so I wanted to bring that quality gear with different function. You know, obviously when you're sheep hunting, you're doing a ton of hiking. So you need to have certain vents and certain fabrics that, that dry real quick. With, with us whitetail hunters, we need some of that, but you don't have to have the, the, the extreme stuff that you have to have for mountain hunting. So I, I just really, over the years doing that type hunting, you know, with my whitetail stuff, I started looking at what features would work for the whitetail space, you know, because for us, you know, you're, you're going to walk a hundred yards, maybe half a mile, maybe a mile to get to your stand and, and you can work up some body heat. And then, you know, you sit there for <clears throat> three, four, five, you know, 10 hours sometimes, and you're completely stationary. 
So those are the challenges that we have. And and with our testing and fabrics, we were able to, you know, get the clothing where we wanted it. But we, the, the, really the icing on the cake was the, the Osseo Raptor camo pattern that we came up with. And I was, <clears throat> this is exactly how it happened. I'm walking through the woods scouting in South Carolina in October and two great horn owls got in a fight above me. And one of them flew into a tree and lit and he just vanished. And, you know, us bow hunters, you know, we've all been around owls and, they're, they're incredible creatures, and the camouflage is unbelievable. So I walked towards the owl, and he flew from that. I think he was in a hardwood. He flew over to a pine or a different tree, and he vanished again. And I said, you know, that's that's the best camouflage of a predator out of a tree in, in, in the woods, period. So I went home and called a veterinary friend of mine and said, I need you to do research on, um, like, squirrel, deer, eyesight, you know, and tell me how, you know, because— an owl preys on squirrels, you know, let's, let's do some real deep diving and see what mother nature created. And so he, he got with some biologists at the zoo and some guys that really studied this stuff and, and, and found an expert, Dr. Jay Knights, who's kind of the optical, I mean, guru when it comes to how different animals uh, see and come to find out that the squirrel, like the tree squirrel, and the white-tailed deer, they have dichromatic eyesight, and they, they do see shades of color. It's a, some guys say that deer only see in, in white and black, but that's not true. They do actually see some shades of color, and that the squirrel and the white-tail have the exact same eyesight. So, I, I mean, I'm no rocket scientist, but I said, okay, nature made this owl to catch a squirrel with his talons from above. It's got the same eyesight as the animals that I'm hunting, the white-tailed deer, why has this not been done? Why have we not? Why don't we have an owl type camouflage with the coloring, the depth, the shadowing, the the patterns? And so that's what we did. We got a bunch of photos of great horn owls, eastern screech owls across the whitetail range, different owls, and and kind of laid them out with some graphic artists and went round and round and round and finally perfected it. And that's the camo pattern that we, our raptor camo pattern that we put on Osseo. So that's a long-winded version of, of how we got there. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's great to understand that as a product developer and researcher and wildlife myself is how we created our company. It's, it's nice to hear those stories because, you know, you go out in the world of marketing and stuff like that and, you know, like some of it's all fad marketing. You know, and I, I've seen a lot in my industry, you know, they started coming out with game calls that were looked like the egg of a turkey and all these crazy, goofy things, you know, looks like an antler, you know, those types of things. But if you get down into what makes the product work and, and you know, camouflage is pretty, you know, there's a lot of competition out there. Huge. It, so many people have tried it. And so the bigger guys, like your real trees and your mossy oaks, once they captured the market, you know as well as I do, it's tough to penetrate that market. And the only way to do that is one, come up with something better than what they have, or two, come up with something completely different than what the competition has. And so those are, those are the two ways to gain the market. And so as I listen to this story and I watch what our team, <clears throat> excuse me, what our team you know, came back with, with field testing the product, I got pretty excited about it because that's the way my brain works. You know what I mean? Now we had been using, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back a little further. It was like when we first started hunting, camo was, you know, the military camo from Kmart and all that kind of stuff. And then as things progressed and Realtree came around, um, Mossy Oak really was one of the big ones, the first big one. I remember painting my face like tree bark mm -hmm. to match my tree bark thing when I was turkey hunting. And so it started to progress that way. And anyway, I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit. We started getting into more advanced clothing with the Deer Society. People wanted to partner with us and we just don't, you know, bring on sponsors because we have to protect our brands. We have to protect our products. So if it's something that we're you know, believing in or using, it's got to work. It's got to have an advantage to it. And so Sitka was one of the partners that we picked up on. And, you know, I saw the price of the stuff. I never bought any or anything. And I heard a lot about it. Some of our pro staff had it. 
And they had this strategy with their camouflage about, oh, you'll disappear. Because I looked at it, I was like, well, there's a lot of white there, you know, and it concerned me a little bit. But so I wear it for years and the performance was fantastic. And I, what I noticed was deer, and, and when I say deer see you, we're setting up our land and we're setting up stands and stuff where you literally have deer right on top of you. And I'm talking five yards away, 10 yards away, where you literally can't blink fast. You got to hold your breath because they're going to see the movement. You know what I mean? And so, but they would look at you. Okay. And they're like, what is that? Is that something? And then they look back again and, and that would go on a little bit and I'd be like, oh, I guess it's okay. You know? And then once we developed the scent elimination stuff with the bays and they go downwind and they weren't detecting you there, it made it even more obvious, you know, that they were suspicious, but then they're like, oh yeah, I guess it's okay. It's not a danger. Well, now what we noticed differently, the feedback that we got from your gear, and it makes sense the way you told the story was they don't even see you. So if you do a little flinch or something happens, they're not seeing the blob. They're not, there's something they're not seeing. And, and it makes sense because you don't. I'm, how many times have we sat in the stand, like you said, and there's all right there. You have no idea things even there. And all of a sudden it moves or flies and you're like, wow, you know? And so, but the deer weren't seeing you. And rather than look up, or if you did move and they thought they saw something, they would just like look away and they didn't care. Where the, it, with the Sitka, they would look and they'd analyze and they'd check it out and then you'd get away with it. With this one, they just don't even care. And so that was quite significant, the, the feedback that I got. And I'm, I'm really excited to wear it this yeah, year. Yeah, well, you, you know, there are good quality clothing out there. You know, there's brands like, like you, you you mentioned that that make really good quality clothing. And that was the gap that we saw. The gap we saw was high quality clothing that can le let you sit in the stand all day long, windproof, you know, dries fast, insulated, you know, that type clothing, but with a real whitetail camo pattern. That, that or whitetail hunters camo pattern. That that was the gap that we saw and the one that we filled. And <clears throat> it just it it makes a lot of sense to, to to us and the guys that are using it with with how it does blend in. And not only you know, when you have a, a pattern of I won't use brand names here, but you know, you have a pattern of a of a particular tree with, right. with limbs and sticks and leaves. That, that's going to blend in with one particular setting. You know, if, if, if I wear that in the swamps of South Carolina and then I come up here to Minnesota and get in a hardwood, it, it's not going to it's not going to work. It's different. It's sure. different. Yeah. The, the, the way we've developed this pattern, it blends in with the trees like the owl does. So you can be in South Carolina and, and I, I travel and, you know, we go from South Carolina to Montana and from Mexico to Alberta. You know, we, we hunt all over everywhere and have tried it in all these environments and it, it works in the different environments, the different parts of the whitetail range. So the, one, one more point on that point is when you would get out of the stand with the, the previous gear, and that's what concerned me was the whites and the grays, you did stick out quite a bit going to and from your stand. And, you know, we wanted to get some of the Western wear so that if we wanted to sit on the ground or get into a, a deal, you know, had more of that Western where you could be on the ground. Because we get those same natural colors here once you get to the ground. Of course, you got trees on every tree line pretty much and brush. So, um, but that pattern didn't work there. Well, this pattern does. So that's another thing that I really like about it. And so if you're able to get in and out without being visually, you know, perceived, that that's an advantage too. I mean, I remember... When we basically, when we first started kind of deer hunting and then in, in the beginning of the research and stuff like that, JJ and I would go and the heat and the cooling and all the stuff, you know, you get that backpack on, you got the camera. So you got two people and we had the, the camera guy had to carry his own stand because we always had a hanger, um, you know, attachment up there next to the actual stand for the hunter. So you'd go in there and then you have to climb, you have to get set up, you got to do this and you overheat. And it wasn't more than what, two, 300 yards most of the time. And you, you would be soaking wet if you pushed it. So we literally would strip down, didn't no clothes. So the only thing we had on was our long underwear when we got into the, into the truck, gets there, get out, we're totally stripped down. 
like 20 degrees out. You know, there's frost, it's freezing. And we're just putting on the bare minimum that we had to. And we would just creep up these bluffs and do this stuff just because we didn't want to sweat. Yeah. And, you know, so that performance. But then if you did sweat and you got up there and then you sat, well, then you froze your butt off, you know. So when you start getting down into that 5 and 10 degrees and stuff like that, it gets a little cool, especially in the morning. I don't know what it is about morning. Maybe it's the thermals or whatever, but as soon as you sit in your stand, that chill hits you. In the evenings, it doesn't do it that way. I don't know why, because maybe it's because it's warm out during the day and then you just slowly cool down. But when you're in there in the morning, it's you just get downright cold. Well, you can tell to that point. I mean, it's like you're sitting there in the morning and you're waiting for it to get light and you're maybe not so cold and then you can't wait for that sun to come out. Right. And that sun comes out, but it's like, man, did it get colder? Like that sun feels good on you, but those thermals kind of switch, those cloud, the little cloud cover, darkness holding some of that heat in. The sun comes out, those thermals start to rise up, you start to lose some of that. And you almost feel colder in the morning because of that, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And in the morning on the way in, I feel like I have a higher or more adrenaline kind of pumping through my system. You know, Good it's point. dark, you can't see what's going on. You don't know which deer around. So then you kind of speed up and you kind of break a sweat and you just work through it to where like an evening sit, you know, you can see. So you're walking in the daylight, take a pause. You know where the deer are, they're bedded down. And it just seems like the morning, for some reason, I just, I rush it and I sweat a little bit more. And, and yeah, because you want to beat the daybreak. Yeah. Because yeah, so you got the anxiety and you got the time factor, you know. So I, yeah, absolutely. And it's that. the coldest part of the day. Yeah. Yeah. JJ, what, what do you have? I mean, I know that you wore, wore this new Osseo gear, um, you know, for the last year or so. And I know you had some pretty cool encounters and your overall kind of thoughts on not only the gear, but also, you know, deer eyesight and how, how you approach hunting from a, a an eyesight standpoint. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, pretty much used it, you know, a bunch of different camouflages and gears throughout the year. I've used quite a few of the upper end brands and been real happy with, with what those are. And then I saw Joe's stuff come across probably social media a couple of years ago. And I think I was the first one in the group that's like, Hey, you know, we should check this out. So talked to Joe, gave it, gave it a shot. And yeah, the first thing I really noticed that was different was the deer didn't even look up at me. I know I was in hidden plot last year and, and another point Mike made about walking in, you know, with a camouflage pattern that doesn't highlight like the real light colors. It's more of that neutral. So you can walk in, you feel like you're more, you're blending in on your way in and then getting up in that tree. It's like, you know, that one night I had seven does around me all within 15, 10, 15 yards. Wind was swirling. They weren't smelling me. Um, not one of them even looked up the tree and looked at me. So that was when I was pretty sold. Yeah. Um, yeah, seven. To, and so just filming for that long, not moving at all, and just locked in, and they're eating and browsing and walking, and all around me, three sixty. So, you know, that's when I was really sold on the pattern for sure. And then, as season progressed and it got colder and started, you know, wearing more layers and more systems, it kept me warm. Really loved the Sherpa liner on the on the mid season. That to me, that that works pretty much most of the season. Mm -hmm. Not so much mid season, almost full season, really. But yeah, just super impressed and just kind of built on the, on the gear. And this year, testing it out early season, mid season, planning to not use the late season. Yeah, that, that's what we all hope <laughs> for. Yeah, fingers crossed. Exactly. But, uh, but, yeah. but we got a lot of work that we do in the late season too. I mean, there's stuff you have to do. You have to move snow and things like that. And you know, it can double a little bit for because it gets like sick, ridiculous cold up here. 40, yeah, I, 50 I, blow wind oh, chills. Yeah. I mean. Bibs and uh, my South Carolina butt would stay inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the late season. just gets so cold, but we're, we're banking on Osteo to keep us warm. But then I sent Joe some video clips last year. I actually had a great horned owl fly into the trees next to me. He's looking at me like, are you the same as me or what? <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you should just open your eyes real wide. Yeah, I was you just turn your head around. Turn your head around. <laughs> and he stood there, or he sat on the top of that cedar for probably 10 minutes just checking, you checking out. me out. What are you? Are you male the, or the deer, female? The deer didn't look yeah, in exactly. that. Did he come cuddle up with you after that? <laughs> and then he went off, but I, it was a just, yeah, just an awesome clip. Um, yeah, I just, I love the pattern. So that's all I can say about that. 
Yeah, you know, I, I've had kind of the same experiences this year. I was out and, and uh, I had a doe come in uh, behind me. I talked about it in the other podcast from a downwind sense, but she she ran right in behind me and it was kind of a hillside where she was even with me. And my wind was blowing right at her and I actually, I, I got a clip of throwing some wind floaters at her and they were flying right. I was telling Mike, the, he's got this bounty out there that we talk about every year with the, with the wind floaters, the phase wind floaters taking one and, and throwing one and it hitting a deer. And I'm like, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. And I pulled it out and she had taken like two steps. Otherwise that thing would have hit her right in the face. But I mean, she's standing there and she's downwind, obviously using in face, but like no clue that I was there. And she's eye level with me. She's 10 yards and seven yards away. And, and like, she, she looked right through me, you know, and, and you hunt with a lot of guys and you hear a lot of people and they talk about, I mean, she was looking right through me and she never looked at me and, and you, you, you Sure, some of those stories are true, some of them are not, but it's cool to have those experiences for yourself because I'm telling you, like, I was there, I'm filming it, and that that deer, there's no reason why she shouldn't peg you. You know, she has all the advantages to, in, you know, in her court, and to get away with that, you know, that was early in the night. That really makes you feel good about, you know, the, the rest, rest of the, the night. Shit, you yeah. know, it's like, okay, we're winning. You know, we're, yeah. we're passing the test. You know, what's next? Um so Joe, you know, not only do you have the clothing line, you have some accessories that, that go along with it. I was telling you earlier, you know, one of the things that, that we've got to, to test now this year is the backpacks. Um, and, and I'll let you go into detail in, in with those, but I, I, I was saying before, I, I'm pretty critical about backpacks, um, because of what I do. I, like I carry a lot of gear in the woods. I do a lot of filming. Um, I like my stuff organized. I like it to be comfortable, you know, especially if you're going on a Western hunter, like in this case, it's whitetail, but you know, like just, that's what makes me critical about pa- backpacks in general and getting to try out this osseo pack the first time, man, I was, I texted JJ and Brian right away and said, uh, after the sit and I said, man, almond, I approved for sure, because the way that everything fit in that pack, the room, uh, the, you know, the ergonomics, the, the zippers and, and how everything was organized in there really enjoyed that. And, and to be honest with you, I was impressed with just the overall performance and comfort of that pack. So that's good to hear. No, that's, that's good feedback. Um, you know, again, you know, Mike, you can talk about this, you know, with developing product. When, when I went into the pack design, you know, I've had, again, with the sheep hunting and, and goat hunting, I've, I've run some of the most high-end backpacks that you can run where you'll have 10 days worth of supplies, you know, to go into the, the mountains and you're gone for 10 days. So the backpacks have to be bulletproof. And, you know, the, the construction of them was incredible. And I, I pulled a lot from that, but but put it into the, the whitetail space, which quiet and ease of use um, were, were things that I saw in, the, you know, what, what I was using as a whitetail hunter that just didn't make much sense. Um, all the, it seemed like all the outside fabrics of the backpacks that I was using was made out of that really heavy Cordura and was loud. The zippers were pretty loud. And then to get to stuff, you had to make three and four zipper pulls to get down to the stuff you were going to need for that day. So I, I'm sitting in a stand looking at a, a pack that I had and said, all right, this needs to be changed. This needs to be changed. And what I wanted to do with the pack was have it where it could be super simple to get the stuff that you're going to need right away. Like when you walk into the stand for an afternoon sit and you climb up, you're going to need your binoculars. You're going to need your release. You're going to need your gloves. You're going to need a couple screw in steps, maybe your bow hanger. You're going to need all of that some gloves, you know, right there. So we made a huge top compartment that you can put all your essentials in with one zipper pull. So you pull that one zipper, you pull out all the stuff that you need for that sit, and that's all, you got your screw-in step right there, you hang the pack, and and unless you really need to get, like, camera gear and that sort of stuff, it's another animal. But for the average guy that's hunting, all of his stuff is right there. Um, You know, your rain gear can be down in the bottom and that sort of stuff. And then the other thing I always struggle with was my pull-up rope, right? I just, I either had them tied to my stand or they were, you know, it was, uh, what do you call it, the 550 cord or, or um, paracord that, that you would have in your pack and it'd get tangled up. So I said, I'm, I'm going to, I had a retractable one that I really liked that I would put on the outside of my pack, but it would always come off. So I made a compartment in the bottom of the pack that you can put one of those retractable bow hoist in and it's got two grommets and you just run the, the the string part out of one of those grommets and then it's in your pack so when you walk to the bottom of the tree lay your bow down you hook that to it and as you climb up it comes out 
You get everything set up, pull your bow up, and it goes right up in the pack. So it's always there. So top and bottom are good to go. You know, you've got your retractable bow hoist right there at all the time. You got all the stuff in the top that you need. And then the rest of the pack is is set up, like you said, where you can organize your gear. And I guess one more or, or two more points on the pack. We set our zippers up. A lot of them I never, I mean, we were talking about this off air earlier. You, you would put the pack on the tree and the pack would open into the tree. And I never could figure that out because you're having to hold the pack up with one hand and reach down with the other and it wasn't efficient. So we made our zippers where when you open them, they, they go away from the tree. And it's not that the things, it's got straps so it won't fall all the way open, but this way you can open it and it, it lean, you've got gravity helping you. Um, so we have that. And then we also have, the fabric is highly, highly water resistant. Um, and it's got a, a laminate inside of it as well. But we do also have a rain fly that if you got in a snowstorm or a rainstorm, you can actually, and it's included with the pack, you can pull that rain fly out or snow fly out and completely cover the pack. So it's 100% waterproof. Is that attached to the um, the pack then? It is. It's fly? in that bottom compartment wonder, in every one of them. I wonder if you could use that to kind of go over your camera too, if you didn't want to. You, got you can, and, and a lot of guys use green. them. A lot of guys use them to, um, to to get dressed in the morning. They'll put them out of the pack, and if they get dressed and you know phase up oh, before sure, they go in, sure. you know they'll they'll put that out like a floor mat, and so they don't get leaves and stuff all over their boots. Put everything on, and then put the rain fly back in the pack, and off they go. I noticed there's. I haven't used it yet, but I got it. I got it. I got a whole bunch of stuff, by the way. Thank you. Very oh yeah, much absolutely. For that. I no, mean no, that, that that was awesome, but I'm. Um, just wondering about, you know, we were looking at it and talking about, well, where's the camera arm going to go? Brian, what did you, you know, and what about the black rack and that too? I mean, where, where, yeah. what did you experience? Yeah. So actually the, the way that my setup fit in there was, um, I had my, my tree arm base right in, right in the main compartment. And there's actually two, uh, options there for your tree arm. And, and it depends. I have two different size tree arms that I use and, and I might use them differently on that pack, but there's the the side inside pocket where it, it would actually slide right down in there. So it's it's inside your pack, but it's it's away from the the stuff in the main compartment. There's also that side pouch, um, which you know you could throw a drink in there or whatever. Sure. Um, but you could slide it down into that side pouch, and then it's got the straps on the side, so it secures it to the side of the pack. Um, so lots of good options there. My camera, all all my accessories fit in there. Batteries, stuff like that. My hunting gear was right there on top, easily yep. accessible. And then the black rack. To be honest with you, this is the first pack that the black rack I could have also actually fit the black rack inside the and pack. And I, sit, I like it inside. To be honest sit, with you, I prefer it inside the it, pack if I can get it. And in it's there. set right. I actually packed it in differently than the way I packed it out. Um, on the way out, I packed it right on top there inside the pack, and it sat there perfectly. Um, but on the way in, I strapped it right to the the outside of the pack. You know, it's got the two straps on the on the front of the pack, oh, and okay. and so the black rack just there. it sits okay. there pretty. They're auto so. locking compression straps. Okay. So once you snug them down and and push the clips, they're not moving. So I yeah. mean, you can. What about washability? I mean, um, there's seems like there's a frame in there. I noticed. It, it is a we call it like a mini frame. Uh -huh. So it it has structure. Um, but but yeah, if you were going to wash it, you would do it with your face stuff and put it in a in a tote. Yeah. Fill the tote up with water. So you phase you'll, you'll it out. Tub wash it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Absolutely yep. right. Yep. That's how you do it. Because that I wanted to bring that up. You know, um phase is a is just a, a great partnership with Osseo because for a couple of reasons. One is part of the phase system focuses on your gear. And what I I don't think the message gets out to everybody that the you're not just cleaning and sanitizing your gear when you're using phase what you're doing with phase when you wash your clothing and your backpacks and your gear and stuff is you're literally infusing that cloth with a technology that continues to work for long periods of time um and what happens is these odors that we have and these these organic type odors that the deer pick out is alarm that's like oh that's a person you know that we give off the clothing. Now, when you infuse that clothing and your, and your gear and stuff. And so when you touch that gear, that neutralizes that scent. So it, say you sweat a little bit going into the, into the stand. Well, guess what? That heat, even though it might not be a wet sweat has moisture in it. And as it filters through that clothing, 
it now is becoming neutralized. So it's a long lasting effect, you know, and I think it's important that people know that, you know, the scent control is, is so huge, but then when you, you know, partner that with the visual where you, the deer don't pay any attention to you anymore. Um, that's just a huge winning combination. And I'm going to feel more confident with this backpack rather than thinking I got to hide it behind the tree or lower to get away from my body. So I don't, it doesn't look so clumpy. I'm going to feel a lot more confident now that they're not going to pick up on that. So I can have it more accessible to myself. Like you're talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're going to like it. It's comfortable to wear too. That was, that was another big thing that I noticed is like you put a backpack on it. You could have the best compartments in the world and hold all your stuff and whatever else, but it's a comfortable backpack when you put it on. Like we talked about that backpack that's sitting over there that I've used in the past for camera gear and sure it holds some camera gear. Great. That's not a comfortable pack to wear. You put on that Osseo pack and you walk to the stand. I had a lot of stuff in there. Like it was comfortable walking when I put it on my back. Yeah, very adaptable too, and it's got those. Uh, what do you call the hip? The yeah, waist, yeah, waist, the waist, waist belt. belt this detachable. You can take that off, and then it does have the load lifters. That if you do have quite a bit of weight, you know, we, we get a lot of. I know you guys too. A lot of the run and gun guys that have their saddles and their sticks and their little platform, and they'll fill that pack up with that stuff. And then we've got the load lifters where you can, you know, really pull the pack up to your body and stabilize the weight. So it can't, you know, it can be, and you know, it, we, we are going to come out with a smaller version probably for next year. Um, you, you know, we've had a lot of requests for that because it is a, you know, it's a 2,600 cubic inch pack. So it's a little on the bigger side and some guys have requested smaller ones. Um, but, you know, personally, I probably won't run the smaller one myself because I really like the way this one's set up to be able to put in everything that I need. Um, so that's, it, we think it's a good size. Pack. Yeah, I learned my lesson on the small pack because, you know, we, we had back the camera packs we were buying back in the, what was the name of that company that sold cameras? And Campbell. Campbell. Campbell Cameras. So yeah. we bought those big, huge packs, you know, and we loaded oh, them yeah. up with gear and this and that. And it's like, dude, that's too much, you know? <laughs> and so cameras started getting smaller, you know, we weren't hauling around those big, huge cameras with the big lenses and all that. And so I went just to the sporting goods store and bought a cheapy backpack you know, put it in there. We had just got this brand new camera. And so I slid it in there and we got in a tree we call suicide. And suicide was probably, I was probably too old to be getting into suicide at the time. <laughs> I think I was well into my fifties. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm climbing up and we're going around circles and one leg's here and this one's there and you got to pull up with the right arm, you know, all this stuff is going on. And I get up in the stand, you know, with all the anxiety and the, and, and the sweating and whatever else happened by the time I got up there. And I take this backpack, brand new camera, put it on there, start getting set up, get my tree arm, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, boom, I hear this noise and it's like, boom, 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 boom. I look down and the, the uh, cheapness of the backpack that I bought, the strap broke on it and it was new. And there went this brand new camera going down the tree, what? 15, 20 feet and mm. got caught in a, in a, that was me and you, wasn't it, JJ? Mm -hmm. No, it was Chris, but yeah. Oh, was it Chris? Okay. I think I bought the backpack for you. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so he got the blunt on. Well, well he was JJ. worried about Cam that big blunk, you know, lunky thing. Yeah, camera getting up that tree. cracked a little bit, but. It didn't do fine. none of the camera thing. That's good. Yeah. But. yeah, I think I, I want to, I want to transition a little bit and, and talk about some strategy when it comes to. Um, you know, tree stand hunting, any kind of hunting kind of staying, uh, staying out of sight of, of deer and kind of hiding. And, you know, Joe, I kind of want to hear from you, uh, about some strategies that you use, but before that, you know, if you're listening, you're hearing us talk a lot about this Osseo gear and, and in past podcast, um, you know, you've heard us talk about, you know, different tools that, that we use to be more successful. And I, I, I want to make it clear that, you know, this isn't, a sales pitch. We, Mike said it at the deer study, we work with brands and partners that we, we truly believe in that we've tested. That's how you built this company, Mike. That's how you, that's how the extinguisher became the number one deer call on the market. It's, it's why people are successful with these tools. It's because there's a lot of research development thought that goes into this. And, and it's cool to hear you, Joe, talk about the, the theory behind the camouflage. And it's not just, this isn't a fad pitch. Like no, you said, Mike, no, this it's is not the egg. Thing. This is, this is, we, we joked before the podcast, like, 
Well, how do you be successful? Wear some Osseo, use phase, extinguisher, call the wife, tell her you'll be home early because you're going to tag out. <laughs> I mean, as much as we joke about that, in all reality, these are tools that we're talking about because we truly, truly believe have tested them and, and believe that they can make you more successful or have a better experience, you know, in the outdoors. So I just want to make that clear when we, when we talk about products like this, like it's based on a hundred percent experience and, and we believe in this stuff. Research, so it, yeah, actual field research. I mean, yeah. it, it's a, it's an interesting thing. Whitetail hunting is all about stacking the odds in your favor. Right. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a game of chance, if you will. And you want to do everything you can to stack the odds in your favor. And when, when, when you look at it, you know, our, our granddads had plaid shirts, blue jeans, no grunt call, no phase system, no sin elimination, and they were successful, right? They, they killed deer. And, and I hear that quite a bit is that, you know, you, you don't have to have camo. You, you're absolutely right. Guys go out and kill deer all the time. But what we are trying to do, guys that want to be serious about it, guys that want to kill mature bucks, they have to do everything in their power to stack the deck, right? To get an advantage, to put the odds, you know, when you're hunting funnels, when you're wearing good camo, when you're wearing sin, or, or you're using sin elimination products, when you've paid attention to your ingress and egress, every little thing that you can do is is stacking the odds in your favor and, and we're getting inches here or, or not even half of inches you know if, it, if it's going to do that much that much just that little bit to put you over the top to be successful on these really big deer it's it's all worth it to us right i mean so it's it, it is stuff that is going to stack the deck in your favor well just think about okay obviously we've hunted for many years you know uh, here at this table and how many times have you been beat by the deer? It happens every year you get beat by the deer. But now let's compare how were you getting beat by the deer back in 1960 or 70 or 80 or whatever it was, or our dads or whatever the case might be. And how, how many times were you getting beat back then compared to now? How many times now... Do you have, I see in some of my blinds that, or some of my tree stands I sit in, I'm, I know I'm going to see deer every single night I sit in that stand because I go in that stand in the right conditions. Once again, information, learning. I go in that stand with the right equipment and I go into that stand with the right knowledge. And consistently, we are getting deer directly underneath your stands within five, 10 yards. They have absolutely no idea you were there. And I guarantee you, I know from my, for my experience back in the seventies and the eighties, when I started hunting, you you couldn't never done that because the, the, that technology and that knowledge, I don't think was out there. No, no, no question about it. Yep. Let's jump into a little strategy and JJ, maybe I'll I'll let you kind of kick this off. Um, you know, just strategy when it kind of, kind of comes to setup. Um, you know, it can be tree stand setup. You've had a lot of success on the ground. Um, what are some of the things that you you look for in a in a setup when it comes to front cover, back cover, just camouflaging yourself against the eyesight of a of a whitetail, for example? Yeah, and I do want to hit on that, but I have one more thing gear related for Joe before we go there. Um, we're scent freaks, scent control freaks. And I noticed like yesterday we were putting together blinds, uh, redneck blinds, ghillie blinds. There's that plastic material absolutely reeks. We're airing these things out for weeks in advance before we even put them in the field. And I know sometimes when it comes to camouflage and other gear, you know, you just get that smell right off the bat. Is that something that you, like on the research and development side, did you did you smell fabrics before you made we, your gear? So, that's so a good, that's a good question. It, no, no, it's, it is a very good question and, because and, your gear does not stink right no, out of the and, bag. And there's two, and there's two. Well, there's there's two things that we do. All of our fabric is tested to have no UV brighteners. You know, that's that's a big thing optically. You know, guys that let their wife wash their hunting clothing in in Tide or whatever it may be that has UV brighteners, and they go and hunt, and they they say, I don't know what happened, but I, it was like I was a stop sign. You know, they just it, the, you, a lot of times it's the UV in the in the fabric or in the washing. So that's something. All of our fabric is treated with no UV brighteners, and then we have an active. Um, all of our fabric is washed. It, it's called an active, and it's an antimicrobial uh, treatment that all of our fabric goes in before it's cut and sewn. 
So it will not have any odor when it shows up. Wow. Yeah. That that's a, I'll tell you what, I bought a tub designed for hunters. And I it's been four years and I still can't get the dang smell out of the dang thing. It smells horrible. Like plastic. I don't know if it's what it is, but foreign odors, you can't it's have just, them. It's terrible. Can't you have know? them. Yeah, and we've had issues with rubber boots and things like that. But yeah, yeah. I was just curious because there's a just this week thinking about those blinds and how bad they smelled and the fabrics and then you know when it comes to the gear. But yeah, it's well just so you know how anal JJ is, we were literally putting in these three hundred, four hundred dollar binoculars in the freezer for two days to get the smell of the it rubber works. off there. You and it does work. Freeze your gear. We did it we we froze <laughs> we froze rubber boots. We froze we did a lot of things like that just to get that initial shock. break that oil up or something and I then don't know clean what it, it is, and freeze it and uh, yeah, how about I don't know. that? Did not know yeah. that. I, now, yeah. the warranty may be void. Yeah. <laughs> well, we wouldn't tell them that when we sent it back. But you don't mention the brand. <laughs> it did, well, it, it held up, so. <laughs> but yeah, back to Brian's question on um, different breakups on front cover, back cover. I was actually going to throw that one to Joe earlier, thinking he travels more with his hunts, so he's in different environments. And, you know, whether it's the South Carolina, you know, if it's pine stands or what you're hunting down there, you're in the swamps, uh, you're hunting Texas, Alberta. Um, you know, just all over the country. Yep. What are some different ways? Obviously, you, you rely on your camouflage to at least give you the upper hand in that sense. But, you know, what are you looking for in those different yep. settings when you're setting tree stands? No, no, for sure. Uh, so for me, obviously, location is number one. I'll give up some cover and some back cover and not, not obscenely where I'm going to get busted. But but location is the most important thing for me. Um, and it, then if we if we get away from that, um, location meaning where, where I'm going to get a shot right? Whether it's a pinch that I need to be close enough to, or, um, you know, a food source scrape line, whatever it may be. Location is the, is the most important thing to me within reason, right? I mean, if you're going to be in a completely bare tree, the size of your, your forearm, you're probably going to get seen, but taking that out of it. And you're right in in South Carolina, the, the way I always look at it when I'm selecting a tree is if there's not a lot of limb cover, I want a really big tree, that I can lean up against. Um, but I prefer to have a tree that's got a lot of limb and limb cover that I can get up in, in the limbs. And that way it's breaking up the front and the back. Um, but, but if, if that's not available, I will get in, you know, a, as big a tree as I can get in. And then most of the time in those type trees, I'm standing 90% of the time up against the tree. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy, you know, with that. Another thing I do in South Carolina when I when I have a tree that is, we get a lot of these. Um, uh, they're they're sweet gum trees, and they're pretty thin, and their canopy is is really high. Um, and and I I will sometimes get in a really thin tree, but get five six sticks high, you know, to where your safety safety line is is my, you're you're reaching in first step to clip in. Um, so I will get really high to get up in that canopy, or if it's a really small tree that I can't get my silhouette broken up, um, you know, I'll, I'll get high. Um, you know, and I've done the opposite in Kansas in a, in a cedar tree. I've been one stick off the ground. You know, you kind of let the cover dictate where you need to be. Um, so there, there's no steadfast rule other than, you know, I'll, I'll give up some cover to be in the best location. You know, that's, that's interesting. And that's a great point. And JJ, uh, I'll throw it to you here, but, um, you know, when you look at, I look at some of the guys that are, that are now wearing osseo and then let's use Ben rising as an example. Like, you know, you talk about getting in the tree and letting the location dictate a lot of where you're going to hang. I think Ben rising, I mean, if, if you followed him for, <laughs> for quite a while, you know, he's, he's killed giant deer consistently. I feel like that is something that he is so good at is making sure that he is picking in that right location when it counts. You know, he's, he's understanding, okay, I need to be at that pinch. I can't be. And if he's 40 yards off, he's going to move that 40 yards. And I I think there's a lot to be said about that. Um, And it's just interesting. I look at the guys that, that have kind of jumped over to the Osseo ship. You have guys like Ben rising and Don Higgins and, and, and yourself. And a lot of these guys that are just renowned JJ Ducar you know, big buck killers, um, and, and have been so successful continuously. I think that obviously has something to say about what you're doing too, because I mean, these guys seen a lot and, and they've been consistently successful. Um, you can't help, but say, man, that's, that's saying something. Well, I don't know about the rest of the guys you name, but I guarantee you JJ over there is almost impossible to get him to see, try new things. 
because he's so ultra conservative about what he's done that works, which is a great trait. But he does not like change. And so, you know, if you get people buying into it, it's not because they're buying into it because it's the newest, coolest thing. It's because it, there's a difference there. Uh, you know, you, when you bring them, as again, I, I'm beating a dead horse here, but when, when you bring a, mar, a, a product to market, right, mm -hmm. you, you don't know how the market's going to receive it, nope. right? You, you have, you, you think it's good. You're, you're, you're you know, you, you've got some deer under your belt. You, you kind of know your way around the woods and, and you, you think, you know, heck, I want to hunt out of this. I think this is going to give me an advantage and you bring it to market and you, you, you know, year one, you're like, okay, here we go. And, you know, we, we had a really good year, year one. I mean, we, we had less than half a percent of returns, you know, for, for guys that were like, oh, it, you know, I'm just not into it or whatever. But I mean, and, and that's unheard of in the apparel business, you know, it can be three, four, five percent. And we had less than half a percent of guys that returned it. And then that grew. And then we were talking about earlier, you know, our organic growth now has just really taken off. You know, you, you were talking about being in deer camp. And, and the guys, like, third, fourth day after seeing it, you know, that, that's a pretty cool story. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but, but that's a, you know, that's, we're seeing that happen. And I'm proud of it. You know, I'm, I'm excited, and, and it's, it's neat when you get something out there and it's really helping guys, and they're, they're able to be successful, and they're spreading the word, and you're seeing the company grow. It's, it's, a, it's a neat time. Well, it's going to be nice. I mean, the, the, exactly what you're talking about is how my business was built, you know, one of, we always tell this story back in the day when the, we first created the deer call, we had some first runs out and um, I, I gave them out to and contacted as many hardcore hunters as I could find, you know, Miles Keller, Rod, JJ, uh, Rod White, he, he Olympic gold medals. I mean, I could go on and on. All these guys were big guys, you know, and so we'd send them this product. And we wanted their honest feedback, you know, and at the beginning we got some feedback that we needed to have. I'm not out there shooting 200 inch deer. I was a waterfowl guy at the time. And so anyway, so we progressed through this and then we realized we want to get this in as many hardcore hunters hands as we can. We did a field test with North American hunting club, came back with a 99.6% approval rating, which is the highest they had ever seen in, they, they tested tens of thousands of products on the market. And the guy called me and said, what, what are you doing? What did you do? You know? And so that's how you find out what you got for a product. And for us to, you know, I don't know, just, you know, butter up to big sponsors and say, oh, yeah, we, we want to be a sponsor with you because you're popular and you got money. And we, that, that doesn't help you. No, no. That does, and it doesn't help the it. sponsor either. Yeah, the market sees through that immediately. Yeah. yeah. You know. JJ, strategy different, agree. What do you got for strategy on uh, eyesight and how you approach a setup from the stand or ground? Well, do you believe that I hunt out of the skinniest trees of anyone you know? Oh, well, that's what, that's what I was thinking when <laughs> and Joe was saying, you know, I wouldn't hunt out of a tree the size of my forearm. Well, you got pretty big forearms, so though, too. But I can, it, JJ's hunting out of some trees that are the size of his forearm, I can tell you. But I, bet yeah, you I mean, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty small. I shot skyscraper out of a, a pretty small tree and... I mean, a lot of it has to do with the breakup. Like they're nice trees, they're red oaks, they're yep. black oaks, they're holding yep. under the leaves, a lot of branches coming out, but there's some sketchy spots, you know, even that like that stand we call bus stop where we're in a lone tree in the middle of nowhere shooting deer. But yeah, bus stop. first you got to be in the right spot. Obviously, you know, you can't shoot a deer if it's going to be walking out of range. So you got to be in the right spot and then just trying to pick that right tree. And it's like, it seems like you always just, for me, it's like I stare at trees for a couple of different years, yep. you know, driving by them and the golf cart or whatever on a trail and looking at it and like, God, second. Then I finally just pick it out and go for it. So I'm actually testing a couple of spots this year where cover is light again, but, and I hung one stand this past weekend, um, took it out of a nice oak tree. The one I actually shot Beamer out of the tree. So just a phenomenal setup, moved it to a lesser tree, an ash tree, which is just a straight bean pole, um, little brush around it knowing I was going to be super exposed or will be super exposed, but it, I feel like it's the right spot for a particular deer that I want to shoot. So kind of going a little risky on this end and, and hoping that Osseo is going to save my butt, but I'm on the front of the tree. So I actually walked some of the trails that I know the deer could enter from and, you know, approach me from. And I just thought like, well, can't be on the back of the tree because I'm not going to be able to get a shot in this situation. So I'm going to be straight on the front 
it's just maybe wide enough to cover my body, that silhouette. And then I'm just going to basically rely on rely on the camo and try to stand up and yeah, and stay, stay still, tight. So, stand yeah. up, and that's still. yeah. I mean, I, I think you can get away with 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 less with good camo. You can get away with with less cover, and and that that opens up the opportunity to hunt trees that you normally couldn't hunt. Again, stacking the deck, right? You're, you're putting one more one more chip over in your pile. And then when I was shooting or cutting the shooting lanes for that spot too, instead of cutting them and just letting them drop, I would actually kind of pull them down. So I'd you know, create kind of a, I, we call it a nest. It kind of cost Chris a deer the one year because I created a nest and he couldn't, he couldn't shoot because he was all tangled in the nest. But yeah, just trying to drop even branches and, and little things in front of you and around you. Try to break you up as much as possible because I am on the front of that tree. So, I mean, anything you can do um, to break it up, the better. But the tree is the, the deciding factor on, on, on the main breakup. And then anything you can do after that helps. Yep. That's all I got. Oh, that's, that's good. Pine trees are tough. I know pine tree stands are just about impossible. Some of those stands in Wisconsin, those red pines are just brutal because they're a, a light silver or light gray, constant pattern going all the way up, not a lot of limbs. And it's the limbs die off as the tree grows. So the whole bottom, you know, 40 feet, there's nothing to hide in. So that's a really difficult thing. I don't know how that um, compares to your southern pines or whatnot, but very similar. Yeah, I love, love me a good red oak. That holds its leaves. Absolutely. And it's, and it's, I think it's easier to talk about ideal situations, you know, when you have good trees in the right location and then the, the issue comes in and that's where good camouflage plays such a big role is because most of the time you don't have the perfect tree in the right location. Right. So, um, definitely about second thoughts in your favor. I will say one thing that, um, people overlook a little bit, I, I think, and, and it's hard to combat sometimes, but lighting situations, um, when it comes to tree stand setup. So, um, you know, when you get into those later hours of sunlight, sunlight going down or sun rising, you know, where is that sun in relation to where you're sitting? You know, are you looking right in the sun? Is it beaming right on you? Um, also shadowing, I've seen shadowing, you know, mess up a few deer hunts. You get those long shadows, you know, sun behind you, deer's coming in, you have a little bit of movement, maybe you're drawn back and your shadow kicks your butt you know, with, the, with those long shadows at night. So I, I don't really have a good tip there, um, but just something to understand and, and look at when you're hanging these stands too and understand what, what your lighting is doing at those times where, you know, you may have, you know, encounters with deer, that being first light, last light kind of thing when the sun is is still in the sky. So that's all I have to add there. Yeah, as far as, so you were talking about that harsh light biting you. I feel like, and I'm curious about Joe's thoughts here, I feel like harsh light and um, or sunny days is a much better breakup situation because it casts all them shadows on the branches. Sometimes you get into that, you know, cloudy, rainy, overcast day, and I feel like you can see a long ways through the timber. What are you thinking as far as like your camouflage pattern? Because I don't have years and years of testing that, but you know, those overcast days, do you think your camouflage excels on, in that scenario or do you think it's better in a, a sunny breakup where branches and shadows Man, are breaking things up? I've had several people tell me um, and, and obviously we've done some testing is that it, it will actually kind of change color, not, not, not to get crazy, like alien type stuff here, but w with the different light, cause it, you know, they'll say they see it on pictures on the website and it'll look one way they get it in their house and it looks a different way in the light and they get it out in the field and it'll be a cloudy day and it'll look away and then it'll be a sunny day and it'll look a different way. So it, it, and again, that's not us, that's nature, you know, nature, built we, we just stole it from the owl so it's their you know it's 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 their pattern and you know they're they're hunting in overcast days they're hunting in sunny days and it's the it's the same thing so you know fr from a setup standpoint the 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 sun and the light that that's probably the last thing i look at it, it is an important part of it um one thing uh, especially that that's a that's interesting that I have figured out over time is in the morning with thermals. If you can get in a sunny spot, is your thermals are going to start rising sooner than if you're down in a, you know, and, and that can save you in certain spots. You know, if you can get in a tree where you can get sun on you early, if you need the thermals to start coming up quick, the sooner you can get in sunlight, the better. So that's a, that's a tip to, you know, kind of file away when you're in a certain situation and you need things to warm up faster 
if you if you if you can find. But again, that's kind of a a very small part of of tree stand setup. Um, you know, kind of to wrap up here, I do want to uh, jump back into a comment that you made earlier because I I I'm curious, and I think a lot of people out there would be curious. So, in the research that that your team has done, um, you talked about deer being able to see certain colors, mm-hmm. right? Um, do you have any insight on what colors that they might be able to see better better than others, or can elaborate on that at all? Yep. So, so uh, shades of blue, shades of blue is like the main one that they see, and you actually see camouflage patterns that have some some blue shade in it. They can't see green. You know, we get a lot of guys that you know. When are you going to put green in your camo? When are you going to put green? Well, they, the deer can't see green. So, so the. A, a, a grays, which I mean, you could say is shades of gray, shades of blue. That they can see those. So you know, guys talk about you know wearing a, a taking a red light, taking a green light. Very, very true. If if you take those lights, they can't see that light. Um, you know, you, you wear blue jeans, and you know, good luck. I mean, a lot of deer have been killed with guys wearing blue jeans, but they can see shades of blue. That's why I got to squint my eyes and JJ got to squint our eyes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, anything else, JJ, that you want to add no, there? No. Well, tons of good information there. And again, like that, it's so cool to, to hear you talk and, and to explain the, the theory behind your camouflage. And, and we didn't get to talk a lot. I mean, you, you talked uh, at the beginning about the performance uh, of your gear um, and, and the background there. And I just want to, kind of end on saying that we talked a lot about the pattern and the pattern is awesome, but the performance of this gear, what I really noticed is one, it's warm. Like you, you wear that, that Sherpa lined, uh, layers and they're, they're warm. Like I, I wore those most of the season, even when it got cold here last year, um, stayed warm. They're comfortable. They feel good to put on and they're, they fit well. That's such a big thing. You get camouflage and sure it could be comfortable or it might be a nice pattern, whatever. There's, there's a lot to be said about that fit of, of the camouflage. And I, I think that you guys have really done a good job of blending all of those things together and, and making a great product for the white tail hunter. Awesome, man. Thank you very much. So guys, thank you for listening. If, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Um, if you haven't done so already, uh, download the Deer Study app. It's free. Lots of good content on there. Go over and check out Joe. Check out Osseo Gear, osseogear.com. Follow him on social. I don't think that you're going to be disappointed. And it's just one more thing that you can stack in your favor. Do yourself a favor. At least go out, test it out. And uh, and I think you'll be, you'll be happy about it. Um, but thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll catch you here next time. Well, I'm a deer. All our sponsors here at Deer Society are partners whose equipment we know we can trust are going to make you more successful and have a better experience in the field. Products like Illusion Systems, maker of the Black Rack, the Extinguisher, and the Phase Body Odor System. Tacticam, Reveal Cell Cameras, 10-Point Crossbows, Onyx Maps, Osseo Gear, Huyman and Big Frig.